America's most expensive war is not on foreign shores. It's here at home as drug smugglers stage a relentless assault from land, sea, and air. Drug cartels from Mexico and South America move drugs into the U.S. to supply a growing demand. According to a recent national survey, about 22.6 million Americans aged 12 and older are current illegal drug users. The drug cartels play a lucrative and brutal game with bribes, intimidation, murder, and violence. South of the border, more than 50,000 have been killed in the last five years. There it is. Oh. The methods are extreme because the profits are insane. There are several large packages, large bundles. These look more suspicious. Fast boats, like this one off the coast of Nicaragua, worked in the 1980s. They could outrun any vessel. Let's get close, he's got him. Until law enforcement Ooh, he just wiped out. caught up with them. In the 90s, the Coast Guard started hearing about a new elusive vessel operating in the Pacific. It could carry tons of drugs and hide from naval radar just beneath the ocean's surface. But they couldn't find one. They dubbed it Bigfoot. Finally, in November of 2006, a Customs and Border Protection P-3 surveillance aircraft spotted a semi-submersible in the eastern Pacific off the coast of Colombia. It was a self-propelled sealed boat capable of traveling on or just below the ocean's surface. Built of fiberglass and Kevlar, they average 100 feet long and carry a crew of five men and 10 metric tons of cocaine. They were deployed in the Pacific to carry drugs from Colombia up to Central America. These were the Cadillacs of the drug smuggling world. Naval forces scrambled to counter this latest threat. For the next five years, Customs and Border Protection, the Navy and Coast Guard disrupted 40 additional subs in the Pacific en route to Mexico and Central America. Despite official estimates that at least five times as many narco subs had gotten through, U.S. authorities took $8.5 billion out of cartel coffers. This massive financial hit forced the smugglers to choose a new route On July 13th in 2011, my cutter with our crew were patrolling in the Caribbean Sea, and we received a call from our tactical commander in Key West. And they informed us that a fixed-wing aircraft had sighted what they thought might be one of these semi-submersible vessels north of Honduras. United States Coast Guard aircraft 2006. While on a routine patrol, the Coast Guard's fixed-wing aircraft, the C-130, spotted the suspicious vessel while scanning the ocean at an altitude of 10,000 feet. Transiting during the day at a fairly high rate of speed, creating a greater wake. All the characteristics that reported to us from this fixed-wing aircraft met the characteristics of a semi-submersible vessel. It seemed impossible, but this exclusive footage from the Coast Guard proved it. For the first time, a narco sub had been found in the Caribbean. Continuous updates from the C-130 confirmed that the semi-submersible was slipping in and out of international waters. It's a cat and mouse maneuver passing back and forth over local and international jurisdictions. The pilot was clearly trying to keep the vessel out of reach of authorities. For Commander Fossey, it meant he had a very small window of opportunity. Our desire was to stop them in international waters. That way, I had full authority for my crews to stop the vessel to inspect. But there's a bigger problem. With time running out, the cutter's too large and too slow to even get to the semi-submersible. It's an area full of reefs and islands and shallow water and our ship can't make a straight line transit to that area. Fossey knows his cutter was still too far away. 
complicating all the matters was Cutter was going to be there late. His only option, he ordered the launch of an over-the-horizon fast boat. A 23-foot rigid hull inflatable boat. And it's capable of great distances away from the cutter. The OTH crew was also armed with M16 assault rifles to counter any threat from the semi sub. We need that capability to prosecute this mission. Without it, we wouldn't have been able to do it. The C 130 fed information to the cutter and fast boat to coordinate a specific interception point when the semi-submersible would hit international waters, a very narrow window of opportunity. Now, we have a duty on the track. Yeah. As we heard that they were about 30 minutes from the point, and we had confirmation that the semi-submersible vessel was leaving Honduran waters around an island, uh, we knew that at that point, we could launch our helicopter. Oh, yeah, I see what you're doing. Our cutter boat and the helicopter intercepted the semi-submersible vessel at the exact same time. Hey, sir, just so you know, we have eyes on your boys as they uh, complete the uh, intercept. It's a volatile situation and must be approached with caution. Semi-sub crews are known to carry automatic weapons. We aren't sure what desperate measures a particular crew might take. We're always ready for any force that might come against us. If intercepted, the crew will try and sink their vessel to keep the drugs from being discovered. Once they detected us, their vessel was already starting to take water. Hey, I'm gonna go ahead and go approach on the, the Coast Guard needed hard evidence the vessel was carrying drugs to convict the smugglers. They had already deployed a life raft. Now, he is over the suspect vessel at this time. They started donning life jacks. The boat has jumped out. Three of the drug smugglers had jumped into the life raft. Two remained on deck. He's, he's splashing. He's dropping. Our boarding team had took custody of the two remaining personnel. Uh, Our team found a hatch. They were able to open it. They could see that there was a hole full of cocaine bales. Hey, hey. He's down there. The vessel was seconds from going down. So they were able to get two bales out of the vessel, and a third one popped out because the hatch was open as it sank. They got the evidence they needed. The narco sub crew hopes the vessel and its contraband will disappear into the depths of the sea, but didn't know they're actually in much shallower water. It went down so fast in 80 foot of water, it went bow up and went straight down. While the drug traffickers were detained, the bales are confirmed positive for cocaine. This makes the recovery of the cargo essential. Our primary concern at that point was to main security over the scene because we didn't know how interested a drug organization would be to get out there themselves to try and send divers down and actually find it. But prompted the United States to send an FBI dive team and start recovering the drugs out of the vessel. This never-before-seen footage documents the first time the FBI technical dive team had been used to retrieve drugs from a sunken vessel. There was a rumor that the drug cartel was going to come out there even while we were there and try to recover them. It's a tremendous amount of money. Why wouldn't they? It's dangerous because the cartels routinely rig their vessels with deadly booby traps. There's something that we had definitely discussed before we did any diving on the vessel. From the sunken vessel, they recovered an astounding 6.4 metric tons of cocaine with a street value of $180 million, double any amount ever captured before. They can now hold up to approximately 10 tons of cocaine, which drastically changes the amount of product that they can deliver. The cartel's deployment of semi-subs in the Caribbean has only intensified and resulted in three additional semi-sub captures. The Cutter Mohawk had two interdictions shortly after ours, and then the Cutter Tampa as well shortly after that. It's estimated that now up to 100 of these semi-submersibles are built each year. But this semi-submersible surge in the Caribbean could not be accomplished without the human factor. 
laborers, engineers, metallurgists, and mariners are all required. But once inside this dark underworld, they soon discover there's no way out. Their personal lives are at stake. Their families' lives are at stake. If the crew ultimately does not get their drugs to their destination, they're held responsible. They will either be killed or their family members will be killed. When extreme smuggling continues, a narco sub-captain gives up the raw details of life inside a semi-submersible. And later, He's got a mask on. He's got a mask on. cartels take to the air and you won't believe how they unload planes full of cocaine. And all the drugs. Holy cow, a bunch of ants. Video images of semi-submersibles captured by the Coast Guard tell us a lot about the sophisticated fiberglass subs built by the cartels. Shorts reaching into his But we learned very little about the working conditions or experience of the narco sub crew members. In an exclusive interview from Bogota, one sub captain, his face darkened to avoid reprisals from the cartels, tells his story. I was the captain of a factory boat. We fished for tuna. I spent 45 years sailing, and I was known for my experience. But after decades at sea and a solid reputation, he found himself targeted by the cartels. They investigated my entire life, where I lived and my family, before they contacted me. For six months, they made offers. They insisted, but I did not want to participate in transporting drugs. Gustavo resisted the cartel's offers until he needed money to pay for his wife's medical bills. Finally, I accepted. It was the worst decision I've ever made. Within a month, cartel operatives blindfolded the captain and transported him to Buenaventura, Colombia, where the semi-submersible waited with his four-member crew in a vessel identical to this one. My first trip in the semi-submersible was 15 days. It was to Guatemala, with four tons of merchandise destined for Mexico. Navigation was very simple at first. Just GPS and a satellite phone. There is a main compartment where they put the drugs. Compartments with some bunks for sleeping. I'd learned who was going to be the engineer, the machinist, and who would guard the drugs. And they have to watch all the others. If anybody panics, they put the trip in danger. He is to kill that person that's in a panic. If you do the work and keep quiet, you will last. If you do the work and talk a lot, you will lose your life. With the drugs safely delivered to Guatemala, the cartel had new orders for the captain. We sunk our submersible and we returned to Colombia by plane. The cartel was not about to let Gustavo retire from piloting semi-submersibles. Once you make your first trip, you are tied in, you are bound to serve. The only way to get out is to go to jail or die. For eight more years, he piloted narco subs to Mexico and Central America. But on his fourth run, his sub was interdicted, very much like the capture scene in this Coast Guard footage. He spent eight years in prison. The pattern of threats, coercion, and murder to obtain new crew members for their narco subs is nothing new for the cartels. And they've raised the ante once again deploying vessels that would be even harder to detect. A fully submersible sub that can travel 60 feet below the surface. 
two were discovered in September 2011 in the Colombian jungle. This mind-boggling discovery reveals the smugglers have gained access to advanced engineering to avoid detection at sea. In the future of the narco subs, their distances will probably get farther to where they're able to go at a faster rate to submerge to deeper depths. And consider the possibility of the cartels cooperating with terrorist groups. They will work in conjunction when it, when it benefits either or the others. And the next generation of narco subs is at the heart of it. The threat would be that they can not transship just to the Central Americas or Mexico, but they can make it all the way to the United States. Then it's not too long of a stretch to think that terrorists or any other threats to our national security could also come. Coming up on Extreme Smuggling, a narco plane under surveillance makes an abrupt landing in Honduras. Are you able to tell the type of vehicle the people are using? They're on foot. And later, never before seen images of a smuggling factory in Peru, where pure cocaine is prepared to slip past customs inspectors. But these things are working out well for us. The cartels, stymied by authorities while smuggling drugs by sea or over land, increasingly move to the air. They appear to be offloading. Drug lords buy up old planes, dispatching daily flights from Venezuela, targeting Central America. We have four vehicles. But along the way, things can go wrong. And when they do, the smugglers can instantly mobilize a small army to take care of the problem. More personnel are arriving on scene. How copy? The first line of defense against this onslaught is the job of P-3 pilots who patrol the Caribbean Sea and all of Central America. Like taking a penny and throwing it anywhere in the United States and then asking us to go find the penny. One afternoon, the P-3 pilots were on patrol over Central America when a call came in from the radar tracking station. It turned out to be one of the most brazen examples of smuggling these pilots had ever seen. They had an airborne target that was unaccounted for, and they wanted us to investigate it. So they brought us into the general area, and our radar operators picked that up. This footage was taken by the onboard cameras of the Customs and Border Protection P-3 surveillance plane. It looks like those numbers are fake. They look like they've been plastered on. We immediately noticed the tail numbers were wrong. They did run the numbers, and the numbers came back to some airplane in some other country that just did not match at all to this type of aircraft that we're looking for. They had been taped over. They did not even look like a legitimate tail number. They are pretty much looking fake to us. Uh, those numbers are fake as fake can be. They're watching. They're looking. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're serious. Once the smugglers saw that we were there, they had put masks and hoods over their faces. He's got a mask on. He's got a mask on. Yes, he does. We uh, have uh, been seen. Right there, we knew that we had a problem. After tracking them for 30 minutes, the smugglers targeted their landing site in Honduras. We never really know where the plane's going to land, and that's what really is the interesting piece of the puzzle, because they're not landing on runways at airports. They're landing in fields in the middle of the jungle. So once they landed, the left main mount got stuck in the mud, and the aircraft spun. Oh, he just wiped out. Get it out. With the narco plane mired in the muddy field, Cameras recorded the unfolding scene. The Honduran police were informed about the smuggler's plane. They immediately dispatched law enforcement to the area. But the smugglers were not going to wait for the police to arrive. A lot of people, a lot of people on the ground are running to the aircraft this time. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a large group of people descend on the aircraft. There's drugs in the engine missile aft. They immediately started unloading the narcotics. It took off four to 5,000 pounds of, of cocaine in this case. So we're looking roughly $150 million worth of cocaine. And one guy does have a long arm. Some of them got weapons. Along with these villagers were several armed traffickers. 
that they were there to not only guard the load, but to ensure that the villagers that they were using to transport the narcotics were doing what they were instructed to do. Okay, I'll load some more stuff off the airplane. There go the drugs. Wow. Drugs are moving now. Holy cow, a bunch of ants. About 40, 50 people start moving in a mass towards a river that was close by. Are you able to tell the type of vehicle the people are using? They're on foot. Right now, we're not seeing any vehicles at all. They are walking uh, away from the aircraft. With the drugs carted off, just a few people remained with the plane. They start spreading some type of gel. Looks like maybe the gasoline or diesel that was in gelled up. And they put some of the blue containers in each of the uh, engine compartment. The so if that's fuel, they're going to torch it. They're torching the airplane. They're... Once he landed, the smugglers on the ground had that aircraft cleared and set on fire inside of 10 minutes. There's a little footpath. They're going down. People followed basically a small little trail in the jungle. I don't see anything. Yeah, a bunch of boats at the end of the footpath. Oh, Andy the... said there was a bunch of boats. Oh, yeah, I see them. There's, there's see a little... load them on the boat. There's a little footpath. At the river, there's a bunch of small boats, which you call pangas in this case. Yeah. They're going up the river. They're rolling. Oh, you know where they're going? We're going to go to that village. It's on the uh, southwest side of this lake they're on. There's a village. At 8,000 feet, the pilots had no way to seize the cocaine. And we don't consider ourselves to be successful unless we get the drugs out of the hand of the smugglers. That is our job. Bottom line, we don't want those drugs coming in the United States. Smugglers know that we're passing this information, so they may take those drugs to that village and maybe in the middle of the night put it on cars or boats or anything else and transport it someplace where they're going to process the cocaine and they may not find it. This particular case did not have a happy ending. Once the host nation law enforcement agents got there, the narcotics were already gone. It's uh, very difficult once the drugs leave the scene for us to be able to successfully get all of the narcotics back. The video will identify and locate the smugglers, but there will just be another narco plane tomorrow. When extreme smuggling continues, our cameras take you to the dark side of the cocaine trade as we visit a smuggler's den somewhere in Peru. This is pure cocaine. We're going to package it so we can stick it inside the soap. For years, drug cartels relied on narco subs and drug-laden planes to smuggle huge amounts of drugs in fewer shipments. To avoid the risk of losing such large loads, they're now employing the opposite strategy. Shipping small amounts of drugs in thousands of shipments. In the sprawl of Lima, Peru, small outfits deal in ounces, but do so with secret methods and rigid controls, even using a new kind of courier. Getting an inside view of their techniques is both extremely rare and dangerous. In exclusive footage, our crew is blindfolded and driven to a drug factory. It's a very heavily guarded complex. Though this building consists of 15 rooms, we are only allowed to film in one of them. This Peruvian family makes over $1 million a year with a minor cocaine distribution network. They start with packages of cocaine that's 95% pure, obtained from a local drug cartel. Our masked host, we'll call Miguel, learned English during several lengthy visits to the U.S. What we have here are bricks of one kilo of cocaine. We transport these to the city by uh, trucks. We hide them in gas compartments. I normally get these in the jungle for about uh, a thousand to twelve hundred dollars a piece worth about fifty thousand dollars in the u.s this is pure cocaine and something that you would not normally see in the u.s it's a lot more potent than what they're uh, used to getting out there 
To get their product to market, smugglers have devised some imaginative methods. The first involves a bar of soap. This is a bar of soap that's pretty common, it's brand new, it's sealed. Inside of the soap, we can uh, fit two ounces of pure cocaine. We start off uh, cutting this very carefully in the middle with the uh, nylon string from end to end to sides. And what we do is we carve out the gut of the soap very carefully and makes a bed. The person who carries the soap, they probably can make about $1,000 just to take the soap back, one soap. It is a little hard to find people to smuggle these type of things, so we'd have to plant it on friends or family members so they don't really suspect that they're taking anything back without their knowledge. With the soap cavity ready, two ounces of cocaine are scooped into a condom and formed into a small package. So we try to mold it right into there. So now we're Using flakes scraped from the interior of the soap bar, a putty is made to glue the halves back together. After a bit of sculpting and drying, the bar can be made to look brand new or well used. Either method works. The small shipments are becoming more common. They're not looking for small quantities. If you do this, say, twice a week, you could probably make ten to $15,000 on a very small scale. Miguel's latest scheme is one that international border agents have yet to discover. He transforms the cocaine into a brown liquid and puts it into vinegar bottles. What we have is a small content of uh, cocaine in there. It's a liquid form. There's a process to make this liquid. It requires certain type of chemicals. We've been using it for about a, a year now, very successfully. The color of the vinegar, natural Peruvian vinegar, is very similar to the contents that we have here. And when it gets back to its destination, we transform this liquid into a solid form. Once a mule has smuggled the bottle into the U.S., its contents are slowly heated, boiling off the liquefying chemicals and converting the liquid cocaine back to its crystal form. This process can take anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes. And once it becomes a solid, the uh, purity maintains. It doesn't uh, take anything away from the purity. They don't really have anything that can really target this type of liquid form. These things are working out well for us. When extreme smuggling continues, while our crew films an interview with a Customs and Border Protection officer, a smuggler is discovered just a few feet away. Yeah, we got an arrest going on right now. A smuggler's vehicle gets tapped sniffed and cracked open. The task is formidable, protecting 8,000 miles of borders from smugglers bringing drugs into the U.S. They're relentless. They'll do what it takes. They'll find a way. If it's not through tunnels, it's going to be in a boat. If it's not in a boat, it's going to be in an airplane. If it's not in an airplane, It'll be in a compartment in a vehicle. They're going to do everything they can to move drugs in the United States and make them profit. That's a recent seizure. To counter this threat from land, sea, or air, the Drug Enforcement Administration set up the El Paso Intelligence Center, known as EPIC. Every day, we are hearing about new methods of drug smuggling. Let's go to here. This is the roofing paper where they found two incidents, one in Minneapolis right. and the other one in El Paso, Texas. Sometimes we'll see the same method demonstrated in multiple parts of the United States. The roofing paper had marijuana in it, glued in place with tar and then rolled it back up. We need to put it out. Then we have to ensure that we can get that information clearly documented and kick it out to state and local and federal law enforcement throughout the United States. Country, so it's, it's nationwide. EPIC brings together analysts from 25 government agencies to look at the big picture of drug smuggling. Just 20 miles away on the Mexican border is where EPIC's strategy is put into practice. At the famed bridge of the Americas U.S.-Mexico border crossing in El Paso, Texas, Field officers from Customs and Border Protection confront the enemy face to face as they filter through 75,000 vehicles a day, constantly in search of smuggling operations. 
One of the extreme techniques is called shotgunning. Sending several loads across at once in various vehicles, taxing customs and border protection resources. One could have five pounds of, of marijuana. Right behind it could be a thousand pounds. If they can put six, seven load vehicles out there and we're not prepared to handle that many, they think that most of the loads will get through. Sometimes we run our dogs not knowing that there's possibly 10 loads on the bridge. It depends on how much people... Yeah, we got an arrest going on right now at this time. A U.S.-bound driver has been stopped and detained. We might have a, a possible load. If you guys want to help me out, do an inspection. The second step in the inspection process utilizes the CBP officer's best friend, a long brass hammer. A solid thump can indicate that a normally hollow space is filled with contraband. It does sound solid, so they're going to go ahead and run the dog on this vehicle. If we do get a positive alert, then we're going to go ahead and uh, scope it to see if we can see the narcotics. The canine detector sits. The response is positive. High technology now comes into play. A tiny optical fiber camera is inserted into the gas tank. Basically, it's like a small video. It's called the fiberscope. With this tiny camera, officers learn that the tank holds something more than gasoline. Yeah, baby. There it is. We do have a positive for uh, narcotics. But I just saw bundles wrapped in uh, plastic. We still don't know what it is at this time. We're going to go ahead and take the vehicle to Area 51. We're we'll going to call dismantlers. They're going to go ahead and dismantle the, the gas tank. The CBP border setup includes a complete garage for dismantling vehicles. A disposable test kit is used to confirm the contents of the bundles. What we have here is a positive for marijuana. The dismantler is going to cut all around the gas tank. That way we can verify exactly how many bundles are in the gas tank. Today was a good day. Fuel tank came out to 40 pounds of marijuana, a street value of over $32,000 that we kept away from our streets. This trafficker knew the risks of what he was doing. But the most frightening development of recent years is the growing number of drug dealers planting narcotics on innocent, unaware victims. They are known as blind mules. One such victim was web designer Ivan Diaz. I was living in uh, Ciudad Juarez at the time, and uh, I used to cross the bridge almost every day. On the morning of January 12, 2011, Ivan is in an express lane for trusted travelers, heading into the U.S. from the Mexican city of Juarez, when his vehicle is routinely inspected. Like every morning, they ask, uh, what are you bringing? And I said, well, nothing. And then he said, could you please open up uh, your trunk? And I said, sure. Moments turn into minutes as the CBP officer inspects the trunk. He asked, well, what are you having in the bags? And I was like, what bags? Then Ivan heard the words no one wants to hear at a border crossing. And then he said, can you please step out of the car? Ivan was immediately handcuffed and backed towards the interrogation center. As he passed the trunk. I got a glimpse of something black in the back of the car. And immediately my reaction was, that's not mine. And at that point, I was like, what's going on? Coming up on extreme smuggling, Ivan was caught red-handed with 100 pounds of narcotics in his truck and no alibi or explanation. Ivan faces 10 to 20 years in federal prison. There's some of them got weapons. When using their own agents to transport drugs in boats, ships, and planes fails to get the job done, cartels recently resorted to a new insidious courier system, turning unwitting citizens like Ivan Diaz into drug mules. Busted at the border for smuggling 100 pounds of marijuana, 
Ivan faces 10 to 20 years in prison. 98% of the time, if they find drugs in your car, you're probably going to be locked up. Both the government and your defense are going to have to do an investigation. We would like to think that you're innocent until proven guilty, but that's really not the case all the time. Several weeks later, while Ivan awaited trial, there was another arrest in Juarez, Mexico. This time, it is school teacher and mother of three, Ana Martinez. I was stopped at a checkpoint by the military on the Mexican side. They told me to uh, open the trunk of my car. Inside, they found two duffel bags, seemingly identical to Ivan's. I couldn't believe what I was looking at because I knew I didn't have anything in my trunk. He opened them and they found some bundles wrapped in duct tape. It was more than 100 pounds of marijuana. And I continued just denying those are not mine. I don't know who put them there. The Mexican authorities questioned Ana for eight hours. She stuck to her story, but the pressure mounted. They wanted me to say that I was guilty, that it was better for me to say that I had put them there, and, but I just kept on saying that I was innocent, that I didn't know those were in the trunk of my car. It was a nightmare. I couldn't believe that was happening to me. Like Ivan, Ana was threatened with a long jail sentence in a Mexican prison for trafficking drugs. This is very emotional for me because I had worked so hard to have a family and to live in peace. And it was actually the time when they told me that I could spend there from 15 to 20 years. When I felt like I couldn't I couldn't continue. I wanted to die. The cases of Ivan and Anna move slowly through the courts. Ivan was offered a misdemeanor with a time served, meaning that he didn't have to go to jail, he didn't have to do anything. He just had to plead guilty and move on with his life. But Ivan uh, stuck with it. He knew he was innocent, and he trusted us as the trial team. But Ivan's attorney had one big unanswered question. I wanted to know a little bit more how the duffel bags ended up in Ivan's vehicle. A break in the Ivan case came with yet another arrest. My trial partner informed me that somebody had been arrested on the same day as Ivan. That raised more suspicions as to whether or not Ivan was telling the truth. This new case had a number of very eerie similarities to the cases of Ivan and Anna. And Acosta discovered a brand new scheme that had been undetected until now and proves the extremes drug cartels will go to. Everybody who's involved are people who are living in Juarez and commuting. The duffel bags that are black, the same size. They have metal ties or plastic ties to avoid anybody from opening that. The way that the marijuana is packaged is exactly the same. People who were targeted were people who were professionals who had employment and the same typical routine day in and day out. Fitting all the puzzle pieces together, this new smuggling scheme was revealed. Mexican cartels were attaching GPS systems to their intended victims' cars, tracking their movements, and revealing when and where drugs could be dropped off and retrieved. But how did the smugglers get the drugs into a locked car? We found out that the drug smugglers were making extra keys, going to a locksmith in El Paso, and giving a VIN number of the cars that were involved. Back in court, the new evidence is presented in the trial of Ivan Diaz. It leads to a verdict of not guilty. I was very relieved, very relieved that the jury had no doubt whatsoever that, that I was innocent. It is a very high toll emotionally for the people who are victims uh, of being blind mules. They're not only victimized by the drug traffickers, but they're also victimized by the government. As for Anna's trial, the man responsible for putting the drugs in her car was arrested. And he actually confessed that he was, he had been the one that had put the bags in my trunk and the trunks of many other people that, just like me, crossed daily. After two months in prison, her case was thrown out.
I was just so released, like I could finally breathe. Those people obviously became blind mules. They were transporting drugs without even knowing it. They were victims of the, of the drug traffickers. For Ivan Diaz and Ana Martinez, the lessons are personal. I check my car every time I'm, I get out of my house. Everybody has to be very, very cautious when they cross their vehicles across the bridge. For the smugglers, it's a business. The profits are great, and it, and it makes me live better. And for the men and women on the front line of the drug war, it's a never-ending battle of wits and technology. We are always playing a game of catch-up with the smugglers. They have the advantage of knowing what they're doing. We have to anticipate what they're doing, which is a much tougher game to play than they do. Smugglers. It is a business for them. The bottom line is that they are just in the business of uh, making money out of crossing those drugs. The victims will matter to them. It, it doesn't matter if somebody's going to go to jail for something that they didn't know. It doesn't matter who gets hurt 